for a moment of silence. Uh, this evening we have uh, two action items on our special meeting agenda. The first is which is the consideration and approval of a resolution canvassing the returns and de declaring the results of a bond election and other matters in connection therewith. I do have a notification from Guadalupe County from our elections administrator, Lisa Hayes. And she uh, says that she does hereby certify the returns for the Seguin ISD special election held on May 4th, 2019, as shown in the attached official Canvas statement as true and correct. So uh, the official results are that we had 1,575 votes for and 800 votes against. So that's a percentage of 66.29% for and 33.67% against. We had a total of 2,375 votes that were cast. Um, and interestingly, one of them was blank. We had one ballot that was cast blank. <laughs> uh, so we passed the bond. This is a great thing. So at this point, Dr. Gutierrez, was there anything you wanted to say? I just uh, want to say that this is a really exciting day in Seguin ISD, I'm very thankful for the support that we were able to receive from, from our community and the fact that they have entrusted us to, to do this work certainly says a lot. I want to take, take a moment publicly to thank the team that, that worked really hard to make sure that we communicated and presenting, presented really great information throughout the community and certainly want to thank the board for their support throughout this process, especially our newer board members that came really in the middle of it all and, and still trusted us to, to do this work. I'm, I'm excited about, about what's going to happen for the students of Seguin ISD. Um, was just at Breezy Meister this afternoon visiting with the staff and I look around and, and think how in a few years it's going to be a completely different uh, campus that's not even recognizable today and seeing those students at that campus it really does make me proud that the community did did support this and I was deleting some pictures on my phone earlier because I tend to let them pile up and I saw picture after picture after picture of bond presentations and a, a lot of work went into that and for you know Sean and, and Bill and Tony really really put a lot of work into it and couldn't bring myself to to delete those photos. I think I'm gonna make an album. Just I'm, I'm just really proud of, of the work that, that came together and I'm excited about the future in Seguin ISD. Thank you all. Well, I think I can speak for the board when I say thank you for all of the presentations that you gave over and over and over again. I think he reached out to every community group there was and every school booster group there was and probably was giving that presentation in his sleep. Uh, so we really do appreciate all the time and effort you went put into it as well. Anybody else have any comments? All right, if not, do I hear a motion to approve the canvassing of the votes and declaring the results of the bond election as the bond being passed? Okay, thank you. Mr. Aguera has made that motion. Do I hear a second? A second. A second from Ms. Duncan. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. So the motion carries 6-0. All right. Moving on to our next action item, which is uh, to possibly adopt the resolution to approve the design plans for the Matador Stadium replacement project, which we're going to call the project. Uh, select a construction delivery methodology, identify weighted criteria to be used in selecting a contractor, adopt prevailing wage rates, and delegate authority to the superintendent or his designee to take necessary actions to procure construction services. Good evening. 
this one's a little bit more fun than some of the other things we get to present from the business department, but President Jimenez, <coughs> members of the board, Dr. Gutierrez, what you have before you is a resolution uh, that we're recommending adoption of several items. And uh, one of the things that we want to bring out uh, to begin with is that this recommendation is a collaborative effort. Uh, many of the ones that Dr. Gutierrez just mentioned, including himself, Mr. Lewis, Mr. Hoffman, uh, Mr. Pisania, as well as uh, we have a specialist contact at our attorney's office, Shulman Lopez, Hoffer, and Adelstein. And then, of course, there's also the architects, Pfluger and PB Group. So all of us have worked together to come up with what's consolidated in this resolution. So what's contained in the resolution, I want to start off with a few things that's a little bit out of order with respect to how the, the resolution is, is laid out for you. And the reason for that is because Pfluger actually has a presentation that they'd like to do for you with regard to the design plans. So we'll leave that till to the end and that way you can field any questions that you may have with respect to the other items. So the other items, as you'll recall, on April 30th, just uh, a couple weeks ago, we presented as an information item the various construction methodologies that are available to a given district. And at that time, we mentioned that if you were to, or if we were to recommend a construction methodology other than concealed bid, then we would need board approval for that. And so that's what is presented to you here in this resolution. The recommendation is for a, con a, con a competitive sealed proposal. The benefit of a sealed proposal is it affords the district the opportunity to make the selection based on more than just the price. And it gives the, the district the opportunity to negotiate with the most, um, uh, the highest ranked respondent. And uh, so you can see the selection criteria. Those are also made available by way of this resolution. And those selection criteria, the weights associated with each of those criteria are indicated on the exhibit. And of course, price is an extremely important aspect uh, of, of the decision. And so obviously it would make sense that it has the most weight, and, and it does. But reputation, safety record, things of that nature are also very important and we don't want to neglect those. So this, uh, all of these items will, will be addressed in the selection process, and those will be a part of the actual sealed proposal that goes out, so all the respondents will know exactly what they will be graded on when they submit their proposal. Additionally, there's a requirement by law that, that the district um, adopt the prevailing wage rates as per the U.S. Department of Labor, and so we have that formality in place. And then as a best practice, it's been recommended by our attorneys that uh, subsequent to these major decisions that you also give delegate authority to your superintendent and then he can further designate to the extent necessary uh, to his designee any other necessities that may come up in order to finalize a contract. Now that might be necessary, it might not be necessary. It could become necessary in, in the interest of time. We only meet as a board once a month, and if we're able to get to a certain point in negotiations, and negotiations break down and we start running into time factors, uh, it would be helpful if your superintendent could execute a contract without having to call a board meeting to do so. But if we're able to meet the, the plan right now is to be able to bring to the board a recommendation as would normally be, normally be the case uh, for that contract without it already being executed. And we would do that at the board meeting in July. So that's the plan, but this affords an opportunity as, as a contingency should negotiations break down or there be some other delay that would prevent us to, to be able to come to you with a recommendation in July. All that being said, the most important thing is, is uh, also we want to make sure that you approve the design plans, which will also be a part of the, the bid packet that goes out. So these respondents will have a full set of diagrams on which, upon which they will compete uh, to give us the best price and the best value is probably a better way to say it. So it have, I, what I'd like to do right now, if I could, before we have um, Fluger come up and present their design presentation. I'd like to field any other questions that you might have, if you have any, 
related to anything other than the plans themselves. I do. Um, and um, when the high school went out, did it go on a, on a seal? No, it did not. That was a, um, the CMAR, uh, the, um, well, let's see, the, get a little, construction manager at risk, yeah, so. That was, and the reason for that, um, usually with the, as you recall from our presentation a couple of weeks ago, the CMAR uh, methodology is typically what you do is you'll bring in the, con the construction contractor before design is complete. Uh, in this case, it, it's a little bit easier decision because the design is complete. There's no value in having your construction manager come in now on the design side, that, that's where the, that's the selling point of a CMAR arrangement. Um, but there's no design left to do, so there's nothing left other than start construction. And so really the only practical uh, methodologies at this point left would be the, con the competitive sealed bid, which is very strict in terms of uh, what you, you can look at for best value. Um, or a uh, competitive seal proposal, which is what the recommendation is. So if this were to pass, when would you put out the RFP? We actually have uh, the, the draft in our hands right now. Um, obviously, we, we have a, a little bit more that we're gonna work on. The, the, ad will, the first ad will run this Sunday. Okay. And when it runs this Sunday, we will have the, uh, the link on our website with the bid out. And how long will it be open? We're closing the bid on the 29th. Uh, the, let's see, I think it's the 29th. It might be the 29th. Of May? Mm -hmm. 26th. Of um, June. Of June, good, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we need, we need enough time, not only to get the bids in, but also to evaluate them. Right. It's gonna be an extensive process to evaluate. And that's why we're not, even though there's nearly a month prior to, you know, it'll close and it'll be another month before we actually bring a recommendation to the board. But that affords not only opportunity for us to evaluate in detail, line item by line item, the proposals that come in, but also to negotiate with the respondent. We need time to negotiate and then to, to get them to give us their best and final offer. Uh, so those things take additional time above and beyond just the ranking and evaluating the bid itself. That's a quick question. When you when you put them out and it advertises just in the state of Texas, or do you go just a smaller circle? Well, actually, we're we're we have um, several firms that we will reach out to directly, and those are all uh, firms within our region, if you will, San Antonio, Austin area. That doesn't preclude others from responding, and I would imagine that they will respond, but there are some requirements that would limit their ability to even do the work, and that's gonna have to do with where they're, how, how much of a presence they have in the state of Texas. Uh, so, but, but really to speak to your, your question, a Texas firm is most likely going to be uh, the desirable scenario. Where do you advertise them? Well, it'll be on the district's website. Um, and then as I mentioned, we, ha we have a list of firms that either we know of or that we've done business with in the past, and we'll reach out directly to them to inform them that the bid is out there and ready for them. People, they, and they're, they've paid attention to bonds that have passed. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. They're waiting. So Coach Bush, I wanna make sure you're good with all the plans, correct? You've yes, seen this all from the very beginning. <laughs> Back to answer that question, I've been getting calls from competitive Have you already? Okay. Yes, Denise. Um, the waiting on the the proposal. Sorry, it's not up there. I found it on the packet. The price, twenty points, all those waiting. Is oh. that the waiting that we normally use? Is that N not necessarily? Um, you know, each each project is going to be really evaluated based on that the needs of that project. So, in this case, uh, with a, a competitive sealed proposal, 
we're we're expanding some of our criteria, learning from what we've done in the past. You know, we have the the recent bids and, and ones that we've looked at, even if you go back to the high school and, and look at, at what was evaluated there, um, it, it's constantly evolving. But to say that we've always done these particular weights, I would say no, this, this, we looked at this, what do we want to evaluate and then how much weight do we want to put on each of those criteria? And then we as a team uh, came up with these weights. Within the RFP, are you going to ask for experience? Um, I want to call this a piecemeal project because you're going to do one piece at a time. First, you need to visitor side and so on. Oh. It's not going to be one massive big project. Correct. Well, the um, and I, I don't want to overstep uh, my uh, role in this. The the architects and Mr. Pisania uh, will take the lead in making sure that. The rollout, you know, how this project needs to okay. take shape, uh, is communicated effectively, okay. effectively okay. to the respondents. All right. Any further questions? All right. And actually, uh, Ms. Robin Popa, the lead architect for Pluger, is here, and uh, if she feels like uh, there's some added value to give to that last question, she can certainly. Uh, provide that to you, but they do have a presentation that they they want to share with you now. So I'll turn the floor over to Miss Robin Popa. All right. Thank you. Good evening, President Jimenez, Board of Trustees, Dr. Gutierrez, Senior Leadership Staff, and distinguished guests. My name is Robin Popa. I'm with Fluger Architects. With me today is also our Associated Architect, Lauren Popa, with PB Group. And if you catch me doing a, you know, looking off my left shoulder, our kids are in the mall somewhere, so it's the mom twitch. I'm used to it, so I'm going to apologize in advance for that. Um, while we're getting the presentation loaded up, I just wanted to take a moment to, uh, again, express our gratitude to Seguin ISD for allowing us to work with you and your staff on this project. It really has been a blessing to see this um, project come to fruition through a lot of hard work, a lot of discussions, a lot of um, decisions that were made in a very collaborative basis and a collaborative nature. So it really was a wonderful project to work on and we're hoping it just hits a home run once it moves into construction. Um, is there a... Florin walked in and is uh, manning the, the kids at the door at the back. <laughs> so, um, like I said, I'm with Fluger Architects and Florin is representing PB Group and we are here today to show you the design concept for the Matador Stadium replacement project. So, as with all projects, you have to really think about where you began. And what we knew coming into this project was that there were several issues that you were facing with your current stadium complex. One, there were life safety issues. You had bleacher railings that weren't up to the correct uh, heights that are required. There were gaps in the, the bleacher floorboards. There were egress pathways that were too narrow, and the list kind of went on. We know that there were accessibility issues, namely the press box was inaccessible. And actually, the bleachers were also technically inaccessible because the ramp leading up to the seating area was too steep by today's um, accessibility standards. Your restrooms and concessions also had um, limited accessibility to those functions as well. We knew that there were structural issues by way of some uh, structural reports that had been done over the years, and it was showing in the welds of the bleacher um, structural system and the excessive weathering and rust that's visible out there today. There's code compliance issues, specifically with your plumbing fixture counts. They do not have the number of fixtures per sex that the current plumbing codes require. And we know that there was a myriad of site issues, specifically drainage issues anytime it rains, safety and security from a point of being able to secure the perimeter, and something that kind of came up through much of our discussions in um, the design phase is the disconnection of the field events. <coughs> which gets into a faculty supervision 
challenge for the high school. So as we began work with the district in developing the design, we met with Coach Bush and Coach Stanley several, several times. Um, we also met with the Booster Club. In fact, um, Florin and James led a presentation at the Booster Club meeting back in January. We met as well with the Band on Fine Arts programs to make sure that they were in agreement with the design direction that we were headed in um, and also throughout the course of these meetings facilities departments as um, led by uh, Mr. Pisania and Mr. Gonzalez as well as district leadership Dr. Gutierrez, Mr. Lewis, Mr. Hilberg they were all involved at various points along the way and then finally many of you will recall that we had a sit-down meeting with smaller groups of the Board of Trustees to kind of walk through the design process and take the time to get any feedback from y'all and that was back in April so without further ado we'll get into the design so this is the layout and the site plan of your new uh, Matador Stadium complex and what this design does is it solves a number of issues it improves your entry points into the facility both from the visitor and from the home side I will go into all of this stuff in more detail later so in just a few slides we have brand new restrooms with the correct plumbing counts we have improved concession facilities we have a reconstructed track and field and reorganized field and track events we have new grandstand bleachers we've enhanced the perimeter security of the complex and we have constructed or will construct a new press box so as we go into each one of those elements in a little bit more detail those improved entries are angular with an orientation facing towards Cedar Street. We believe that's important because it promotes visibility towards the main entry of the complex. The last thing that you want from a school security point of view is to have people who are unfamiliar with the area just walking around aimlessly trying to find the way into the complex. And we know from our discussions with um, your district staff, even though there's parking in front of Goldie and parking around the high school, a large majority of spectators actually park here at this facility and then walk across Cedar to go over to the complex. So we felt that angling those entry points towards Cedar was important. On the home side, I apologize for the audience. The, this screen looks a little bit better than that one. But on the home side, the ticketing booths have three ticket windows to kind of facilitate getting a larger volume of spectators into the facility and we have also included the provisions for a sports store this is where the booster club is selling their sports paraphernalia the visitor side also has a comparable ticket booth but only with two ticket windows and no sports store this is a rendering of what that entry point will look like this is from the home side and this is also I believe printed on the back wall and taped up as we go into the restrooms on the home side we are providing 54 fixtures for women it's hard to believe but uh, given the size of the stadium that is how many fixtures are needed uh, we are providing 28 fixtures for men <laughs> there better not ever be a line <laughs> Uh, we are providing storage for um, you know incidentals track and field um, apparatus or uh, turf maintenance um, equipment we have a dedicated family restroom a custodial closet in order to properly maintain the facility and a concession stand and if we take a closer look at the concession stand on the home side there are six transaction windows so we're matching the same number of transaction windows that are out there at the concession building today we have the windows oriented towards the main point of entry so it's very obvious <clears throat> where the concession sales are there is dedicated storage specifically for the concession program the concession and the booster program we have a hand washing sink and a dishwashing sink proximity to outside because we know that uh, grilling is a favorite uh, feature of the booster club I've heard lots and lots about the pork chop um, and as a part of all of the systems we are providing a grease trap so that we are being responsible stewards towards the sanitary sewer system in this area 
And we've had multiple conversations with the Booster Club and gotten the list of equipment that they intend to outfit this space with so that we can make sure that we're providing adequate electrical provisions for that equipment. On the visitor side, we are providing a smaller number of fixtures, but still a pretty impressive number. 27 fixtures for the women, 14 for the men. Uh, visitor side also has a storage space that is um, on the end of that building. Also has a family restroom, a custodial closet, and their concession stand as well. Their concessions is very similar to the home side, also with six windows. The windows are oriented towards the main point of entry from the visitor side of the stadium. They have dedicated storage, the same hand washing and dishwashing sinks, proximity to outside, grease trap, and electrical provisions to support all of the booster club equipment. And this is an image of what the inside of that concession stand will look like. So we're doing a little bit of um, a decorative paint accent in there because those windows we do hope will be open for most of the game with lots of sales going through. And so just getting a little bit of that school spirit color infused in there we thought was a plus. Moving on to the track and field. What we did do is we widened the field. So if you go out to the field today, it's a little narrow. It's a little difficult to play regulation soccer on that size field. So we widened it so that you could have a regulation soccer field on that um, new and improved turf system. By doing that, we were also able to um, design a proportionally shaped track. The track that's out there right now is a little long for um, today's track standards. We also provided space in between the track and the bleachers. So anybody who has ever been running or walking on that outside lane, it is not very comfortable walking right up against the, the fence and the wall line that's right there at the bleachers. So we have about six feet of space in between the edge of the track and where the bleachers start. And we did move some field events inside the complex. I talked earlier about one of the things that we garnered from our conversations with Coaches Bush and Coach Stanley was the fact that a lot of times there'll be a single faculty person or single coach who is tasked with overseeing multiple uh, field events. And it's hard in the way that the current complex is organized because some of those events are uh, very far from each other. So it presents a supervision issue. So what we did is we moved the um, high jump, the pole vault, long and triple jump inside the complex because there's a greater likelihood that all of those events or some combination thereof is being coached by the same person. And then we are proposing to move discus and shot put outside because chances are that those events are being coached by the same person. We did not look at moving discus and shot put inside the complex because there simply wasn't enough space for it. The shot put could have probably been put in, but the discus requires a lot, much bigger footprint. And one of the other things that you'll notice is there's a lot of gray around that um, track, and that is done on purpose. One of the um, points of feedback that we got from the maintenance staff is that when there's a lot of grass inside those complexes, it's very hard to maintain. And when something's hard to maintain, it's easier to not maintain. So what we are proposing is to pave throughout the entire stadium complex to really make it as maintenance friendly as possible. We are providing new bleachers. So on your home side, there's 5,408 seats, 40 of which are designed exclusively for wheelchair seating. On the visitor's side, there's 2,802 seat, two seats, with 22 of those being accessible. So the total stadium capacity is 8,210 seats. Now, what we did talk uh, at length about was the fact that this stadium's total seating capacity is less than what your current stadium has right now. But we were working within some tight constraints. So you're bound on the north side by Cedar Street. You're bound on the west side by the high school and the, the new parking lot. You're bound on the east side by Goldie. And really that west-east limitations are what could dictate the greater amount of seats that could possibly be. But we weren't able to push out any further in addition to widening the field and providing that space in between the track and the bleachers, both of which we felt as a team were very important strategic moves for this complex. Conceptually, you could add on bleachers on the ends of these two um, bleacher segments. 
but then you're getting into, especially on the home side, line of sight issues where those seats aren't probably going to be very good for viewing the game, but it is a possibility in the future. So this is a view of the stadium looking back towards the press box. This is the home side of the bleachers. And what we wanted to point out is that the bleacher systems are an aluminum system with bench style seats. That it is a closed riser system. And so what that means is when you drop your popcorn or you drop your soda can, it's not gonna fall through the bleachers to the unsuspecting person who's walking down below. It's gonna stay at your feet for you to pick up and take to the garbage can. Um, but really what it does is it helps maintain um, the level of litter, trash, debris, purses, wallets, cell phones, etc., and keeps it up at the top with the spectators rather than having it fall down below. We do want to point out that it's not weatherproof though. So if you get a really bad rain, water will still fall through, but it is um, more beneficial than having water and uh, popcorn raining down on you. We also included provisions for a portable platform and stairs for use by the band. This uh, was a result of our discussions with the band and the fine arts department. And this is really to help them to facilitate um, when they're playing music in the stands during a game so that the band director has a place to stand where all the band members can see him. And then the stairs are to promote easy <coughs> moving down off of the bleachers into the field for their halftime performances. So when we look at perimeter security, one of the um, feedback comments that we got from the coaching staff was that the problem with the stadium now is that it's not secure. So even though we want to promote community use of some school facilities, when the community is not being responsible stewards of that, sometimes the better um, approach is to secure it so that you're not having to deal with dog poop on the field while your football players are going to come out and play and things of that nature. So, so we did look at the way that we can secure the perimeter of the complex. So all around the stadium we have an eight foot tall fence and for three of the four sides it's um, a chain link fence. The fence or the barrier that's going to be along Cedar Street is actually a masonry wall. Um, so that it will encourage people to come into the complex purchase a ticket and support your matadors in an appropriate fashion and don't stand outside of the fence and get a free um, game from the street. There is also a four foot tall fence to further separate spectators from athletes so that nobody who's there for a game accidentally wanders onto the field. We have strategically placed gates at selected areas for ease of accessing one side to the other or for exiting the complex. And there are also two dedicated vehicular access points along Cedar Street, both for maintenance, but also one dedicated for emergency vehicles. So moving on to the press box. It is a two-story press box that is elevated. The main access for the press box, not including the elevator, is from the stairs that are integrated into the bleacher system. And there's 2,678 square feet within this press box. So on the lower level, which would basically be almost level with the topmost bleacher seat, you have a spot for the radio personnel, the persons managing the time clock, the persons managing the PA system, persons managing the scoreboard, and between the PA system and scoreboard, there is a window so that they can visually see each other and send cues to each other. There's a space for the media and the press. And then we were gracious enough to provide a space for the visiting team's coaches. There is also a, a restroom on that uh, level and a custodial closet and then off on the right side, which would be the north side, is the elevator. On the upper level, we have the space for the home coaches. We have the filming deck right in the middle, which is aligned on the 50-yard line. We have an auxiliary or a bonus room, if you will, and that the function of that can change with each game. If, if there's a veteran's dedication or um, ceremony and you want to have some guests of honor come and watch the game up from that suite, that's available to them. 
This level also has a dedicated restroom, and then the elevator does go up to the upper level as well. So the interior of the press box, we took a lot of the cues from the high school and we matched the same finishes. So we wanted to make sure that the complex as a whole seemed very integrated and well thought through. So we were using the same wall tile that you see in the high school and the same flooring and the very similar uh, color palette. And then this is a view from the coaches suite out onto the field, the home coaches. And uh, board I placed in front are the proposed finishes. Um, most of these finishes are obviously for the press box. The restrooms and the concessions get kind of a very streamlined, um, maintenance friendly, bare bones sort of finish treatment. And so with that, I'll take any questions. I have um, just a quick one. Yeah. The concessions, the, what you showed there is kind of bare bones. They're going to configure that the way that they like it to be, right? Yes, during our conversations with the Booster Club, we went through and itemized all the equipment that they're currently using, and we talked about what pieces they are intend to bring over with them. Some they may choose to buy new, but for the majority of the equipment, they are planning on moving everything over and reconfiguring it into those spaces. Now, um, Mr. Biker has seen the layout, and he's, I think, already sketched out where each piece of equipment is going to go, which was actually very helpful because it helped us really locate electrical outlets and drains and things of that nature in the spots that were appropriate to that equipment. And the same with the store as well? Correct. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. The store is also has a transaction window, but it faces inside the stadium complex. So the thought is, is that somebody is coming into the complex after they've purchased their ticket and gone through the gate, then they can visit the store. Um, with the family restrooms, this, there's one on each side, and that has a diaper changing area. Yes, it does. And is that the only one on each side, or is it? Are no, there I some in the women's restroom? It, the the larger women's. restrooms also have one too. Yes. Um, <laughs> Okay, that's good. News. Yes, that we, we make sure we put those in. All right. Having lived through that. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then I'm, I'm just not clear on the wheelchair accessibility. Will that be at the bottom or will they ride the elevator up and have wheelchair accessibility? No, the wheelchair uh, seats um, are going to be at the bottom platform. Okay. And so they will take... Um, will be the ramp? Yeah, you can actually see it in this image right here, actually. So the ramp will go up and then that platform, as you're walking along, will have a series of benches with spaces in between. So the idea is that the wheelchair will sit in the space in between the bench, but the benches are flanking it so that you can have a companion sitting with you. Okay. So as I look at the concession stand, Robin, mm -hmm. right in, in, on, 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 I guess, the side, um, are those braces underneath oh, the... Sorry, I didn't realize we were looking at that. Underneath the bleachers, mm -hmm. it looks like there's railing. Is that all fenced in? Is this what you're talking about? Uh, under. No. Okay. Under? Go okay. to the Go right, no, to the other side. Under, it's dark right here. Yeah, yeah, it is. Here. That's right here. Exactly. Yes. 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 So all that part is fenced in so that you don't get um, people wandering in there. Um, there's a, a code issue and the fact that you can't have anything that could possibly hit your head. But then there's also a safety concern if you don't want people just messing around down there. So where the sometimes there's crossbars underneath the features. Are those fenced around so that people don't walk underneath those crosses? So the, the structural members of this system are a little bit wider than perhaps what you see out in your current stadium, and it's by design so that you can have wider spans. You have larger columns, if you will, but you have wider spans. Okay. And then the cross bracing, the X's, they do happen still, but they're further up. So they're higher up to prevent somebody from hitting their head or being a... Um, a climbing challenge. I'm so tall. <laughs> <laughs> are there the numbers for the seating? Are they on the side of the street, on the the seat, or up on top? Um, 
So it, it really kind of depends. We can do the tag where it's on the front face of the seat or on the top. It just, it, that part really depends on which bleacher manufacturer is awarded the contract. They each have kind of their own little ways of So on doing home side, how many sections are there? So seven, with the one in the middle being a little bit wider. Each one of these lines is the aisle way to walk up and down. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And again, the configuration is still somewhat speculative because each bleacher manufacturer has their own way of detailing. But what we do want to point out is that the two aisleways on either side of the large expanse of bleacher system are the pathways up to the press box area for somebody who doesn't require an elevator. So whether it's a straight shot as we've illustrated or sometimes bleacher manufacturers will show it come up, go to the side and then continue up. That part we'll get into once the uh, vendor has been selected by the general contractor and once we start reviewing uh, shop drawings. I did also want to address the, um, the phasing. I know um, Tony had mentioned that I might uh, want to add something to that. Part of the evaluation criteria will be to um, give special consideration to contractors that have gone through complex phasing projects. This one is going to be fairly complex because it's your only stadium, and so we have to kind of work that in. We've had a lot of meetings with uh, district staff and with the coaching staff on an appropriate way to phase construction in. Unfortunately, there's not really a way to phase construction that it will not impact anybody, and that's just um, that's kind of the the downfall of having to take on such a large um, complete reconstruction of this facility is that at some point something is going to get affected. So what we have built into the plans is a three phase construction sequence which we believe is achievable and has what we feel is the minimal amount of disruption to the campus and district operations but we are proposing that the um, proposal form that will go out to prospective bidders will have an area for them to volunteer either cost savings from a material point of view or cost savings from a time point of view. So if they have a different way of constructing or sequencing the events that are going to be needed to do this project, we want to review those because they may have a better way to skin the cat, if you will. I think the thought out in the community, and I don't know if anybody else has heard, is when will it be completed? So the goal is to have it complete for start of football season, not this coming academic year, but the year after. 2020? And complete? Concessions, complete, complete. Bathrooms, mm -hmm. everything. Yes. So the phasing that we've been developing and what is what we are asking the contractors to bid on is we will start construction in earnest on the visitor side um, after the last major game that's going to draw a really big crowd. And we've identified that as the Central Catholic game, so September 13th. So the contractor will take over the visitor side at that point. Home side and the field will still be open and available for use. And then when football season is over, the home side will be given over to the contractor. The field and track will still be in use. And then once soccer season is complete, the spring of 2020, then the field and the track get handed over to the contractor to do the last leg of improvements with the idea that in the summer they're wrapping everything up and by the start of the academic year, the football season, fall of 2020, they are done. We have had preliminary conversations with district staff that it might be um, beneficial to maybe think about the first couple of games as being away games because unfortunately construction is kind of an unknown entity as far as schedule can uh, go and things like weather, material delays, all of that can negatively impact a schedule through no one's fault. So 
just trying to stay six steps ahead of the ball. We're, we're, in, we're looking at possibly having those first couple of games be away games too. I just want to thank James for all of the work that he's done. Um, he's worked very closely with both um, Florin and, and Robin for since November, has it been November? <laughs> and uh, he's put a lot of thought and, and energy into this and certainly appreciate his dedication to this project. We couldn't agree more. Any other questions? We all feel fairly confident to go out and talk about this. <laughs> so really the only thing that, that we're going to miss out on will be graduation next year. I'm looking for Bill. He's hiding behind the pillar. Is that correct? <laughs> we're still going to have graduation. But not on the field. <laughs> okay. Can these plans be put on our website for folks to look at? This presentation. Yes, we'll, we'll make a copy of the presentation available. I'll take all the, the fun little animations out so it's a little bit cleaner, but we'll, we'll, we'll make that available. Thank you. It'd be a great, to, great addition to the Bond 2019 website. I know there are a lot of people who are very eager to see the design, and, um, and, and I think there's going to be a lot of excitement once they do. <laughs> Well, if there are no further questions, do I hear a motion to adopt the resolution for the various construction matters regarding Matador Stadium Replacement Project as presented? I move. Okay. We approve the resolution for the design practice plans of the Matador Stadium Replacement Project. Okay, I have a motion from Ms. Moreno and a second from Mr. Amador. Last chance for questions? No. Not all in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 6 0. Thank you. And we're off. We're off. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, James, again. Robin, just thank you for everything. Mr. Bogish, thank you. Coach Bush, everyone. I think this is really going to make a big difference in our community. Well, I think it is time. Do I hear a motion for adjournment? I move to adjourn, Madam President. I have a motion from, <laughs> from Ms. Duncan, second from Mr. Amador. We are going to adjourn at 619.